Welcome to the Toll and Stone podcast. I'm Garrett Ryan, and my guest today is Dr. Simon Goldhill. Dr. G- Dr. Goldhill, welcome to the program. Nice to be here, Garrett. Oh, thank you. Um, Dr. Goldhill is a professor in Greek literature at King's College, Cambridge, and has published extensively on Greek tragedy and the reception of classical literature and classical life in general in Victorian Britain, among many other topics. Today, however, I wanted to discuss um, his books on the history of Jerusalem and the Jewish temple, and to try and, in a more broad sense, consider the place of Jerusalem in the classical world. Now, obviously, the history of Jerusalem is complicated, to put it very mildly, um, not only by the very divergent agendas of the present, um, religious, political, whatever else, um, but also by the very conflicting perspectives of our ancient sources, which range from Tacitus to the Talmud. Um, So how have you tried to mediate those very different perspectives in your work? Well, the Jewish material is easy to deal with. Jerusalem is the center of the Jewish world, is a cultic place, and it's explored in many different ways through uh, Jewish literature, particularly in the Talmud, but through other, other texts as well. And it's part of Jewish liturgy up to today. So Jerusalem has a continuity in Jewish thinking. Uh, it's one of those continuities we call tradition, which means it's changed many times over the years. What's interesting is that the way Jewish uh, culture has developed has often been in relation to Greek and Roman culture. And for Greece and Rome, Jerusalem was really not that important to begin with. It was a backwater. It's a small town in the middle of nowhere. At the time, you must remember, it had a very small population uh, and uh, had no strategic importance at all. So until uh, the Romans wanted to conquer uh, the whole of Palestine and then rule the whole of Palestine, and before that, the Seleucids wanted to have the same control, there was no need for them to consider Jerusalem. So what's interesting is there's a big difference between the Roman and Greek realpolitik and Mm. the Jewish theological insistence. Mm. Right, yes, a profoundly different place between whether you said a strategic backwater or a theological slash cultural um, center. Right, 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 yeah, yeah, Yeah. sinister, whatever else. Um, Yeah. And so I guess it's thinking about in terms of... uh, you know, Jerusalem appears sort of haphazardly in Greek Roman texts, um, at least mm-hmm. before the empire becomes Christian and it becomes a new kind of center. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the first, uh, chronologically anyway, uh, collision uh, encounter between Jerusalem and the classical world um, seems to be um, this possibly apocryphal visit of Alexander um, to Jerusalem in the wake of Issus. And it probably is apocryphal or however else, but um, if it is indeed um, fictitious, um, why was it invented? Alexander was a hugely important figure in the imagination of the Mediterranean. He was the first person who really constructed a pan-Mediterranean culture. Uh, He came from Macedonia in northern Greece, and from that position he conquered not only the whole of Greece, but the whole of the Persian Empire, that was the biggest empire of the time. And when he got as far as the borders of India and uh, across Afghanistan, and because of that military adventure, he really spread Greek culture, Greek language, throughout that era, throughout that space, I beg your pardon. And it became a Greek-speaking community. So one tends to forget, and people like to forget, for all sorts of political reasons, that uh, Jerusalem was a Greek-speaking place, particularly amongst the elite, for more than 500 years, so was most Mm -hmm. of Palestine, so was most of Egypt. And so Alexander was the figure who really founded the culture, and he became this sort of not just an iconic figure, but almost like a demonic figure. How could one man have conquered so much so young? He was a real figure of the imagination. So when you've got someone who's like a superhero, he has to come to your center. (laughs) He has to be there. So we know he walked through Palestine, but there was no reason whatsoever for him to go anywhere near that backwater. It was strategically unimportant. So if he did arrive on the coast, walk through on the way to Egypt and then across the way to India, he went through bits of what's now modern Israel, but there's no way he'd have any need to go to Jerusalem. So the story that he met the high priest and that he bowed down before the high priest's authority is one of those stories that uh, oppressed and minority cultures use to say how important they really are in their own eyes and in the eyes of the world. So I'm afraid it is a fiction. A good fiction, uh, right. but a fiction. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, a figure to conjure with, right. Yeah. Right. Um, so moving to uh, actual history, we have, of course, the famous conflict uh, between uh, the Maccabees and the Seleucids, um, which is you know, laid out you know, in the books of the Maccabees and, and elsewhere. 
Um, and this is, of course, a, a very complicated uh, conflict. Um, really, it seems to be a, a sort of a, a civil war uh, between factions among the Jewish people that sprouts out of control and involves the Seleucids um, pretty early on. And, and, uh, but it seems to be centered on, uh, in various ways, uh, the place of Greek culture, of Hellenism, um, both physical um, and you know, cultural, um, in Jerusalem itself. Um, is that a fair assessment of that conflict? Uh, yes, it's certainly a fair <laughs> assessment in the eyes of the Jews, and certainly uh, the Jews. Mm -hmm. Whether the Seleucids saw themselves as necessarily imposing culture is another matter. Mm -hmm. But they did actually have a very strong view of their own culture. They had their own calendar. They developed a really strong sense of a communal center. So in many mm -hmm. senses, the Seleucids could well have tried to impose their culture on Jerusalem. But what's so fascinating is that this conflict is celebrated now in the festival of Hanukkah by Jews across the world. Mm -hmm. The Maccabees has a letter right at the beginning of Maccabees 3 that says, here's a letter from your colleagues in Jerusalem to, 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 your, to, to our colleagues in Alexandria saying you should now celebrate Hanukkah because this is a, we've mm -hmm. had this great triumph. And it's a great triumph, they say, of Jewish culture surviving in its purity against Greek oppression and against Greek culture. And that's how it's celebrated, how you're taught when you're six years old in, in school, you're taught that <laughs> story. The difficulty is that the story is written in Greek. Mm -hmm. So the way in which we have a triumph of Judaism over Greek, it's quite difficult to reconcile with the fact that the texts are all written in Greek. There's no version in Hebrew until we get to the Talmud a long, long time later, maybe a thousand mm -hmm. years later. So, <clears throat> 800 years later. So we have one of these fascinating moments that Greek culture is all pervasive. It's absolutely a dominant culture. Everybody wants a piece of Greekness. To resist it, you can only resist it in Greek. That's mm -hmm. the trouble. And so you end up with every Jew in the world being Hellenized and many of them denying they've been Hellenized. You know, it's a little like a modern mm. Jew denying that they have anything to do with modernity while driving a Volvo and speaking to <laughs> golf. Right? Fred, just right, right. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, that's a very interesting way to put it. Um, and exactly right, that, that, that Greek language and Greek culture is so pervasive, so unavoidable mm. in many ways, yeah. that it's just woven into the story itself. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking about the, the physical spaces of Jerusalem, I know they're, they're always looking for this Leucid uh, citadel, uh, you know, the Acra, whatever else. It's, it's the actual place of imposition, mm. you know, where there was this locus of, you know, Greek or Hellenizing power. But, of course, the whole city itself is Hellenized to some degree. Um, yeah. And Romanized later. Right, right. Christianized later. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost impossible to find any real place in Jerusalem. Every place is layered with different levels yes, yes. of reality, different levels of purity. And... Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the joys and confusions of the place. That when you mm -hmm. go there, you're told you're standing in the place where Jesus stood. But if you know the archaeology, you know that place was at very least 14 feet below you. Right, right. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. people who worship at the Western Wall, saying this is the holiest place of the temple, mm -hmm. should know it's a retaining wall that had no holiness <laughs> at all. In the so right, right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but those myths are part of Jerusalem now. Mm -hmm. And I suppose Jerusalem has always been not just a city of longing, where people want to create a sense of uh, great spiritual worth, but mm -hmm. also a city of fantasy and a city of myth. And it's uh, all the way up into the 20th century. I mean, mm -hmm. when General Allenby, this is also, you know, I might as well say British myth here, we're, we're told that when Allenby marched into Jerusalem, uh, that when the British conquered uh, Jerusalem to set up the British mandate in 1917, that because of his humbleness in the face of the holiness of the city, he walked in on foot. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the cabinet papers for this period. We know this was a completely constructed event. <laughs> it was uh, not a spontaneous moment. Allenby himself regretted having to be uh, humble. He would have rather walked in and go <laughs> driven in drive. <laughs> right, right. He just thought they had to construct a public event. And so mm -hmm. that's another little myth of you know mm -hmm. the, the humbleness of the entrance into Jerusalem. But there you go. <laughs> Right, Jerusalem demands myth-making to some degree just to, uh, right, to right. weave, weave yourself into that tapestry. Yeah. Um, and so thinking of, I guess, um, again, uh, the, the idea of how Jerusalem becomes a, a place of, uh, of, to conjure with, uh, as the thing that himself mm. was, and moving into Roman history. Um, so, you know, of course, uh, mm. Pompey the Great, uh, during his great conquests of the Near East in the 60s uh, BC, um, does, unlike Alexander, um, actually enter the temple. 
um, and is supposedly astounded to find nothing inside the Holy of Holies. And this is just, you know, the he's waiting to see some grand golden idol and there's just nothing at all there. Yeah. And this is sort of, a, I think, an emblematic moment of the, the failure of our classical authors to ever really try mm -hmm. to grapple with um, what Judaism um, or Jerusalem itself um, means, uh, at least in its local context. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned before how our sources about Jerusalem um, from before the Christian period on the classical side are exiguous. They're kind of just, you know, it's there, you know, they rebelled, we talked about it. Um, but how can we compare, say, discussions of uh, Jerusalem and the temple um, to other, I guess, classical ethnographies? Like thinking about Tessus and the Germans, for example. You know, I think about the Jews and, the, and Jerusalem as, let's say, a, a barbarian, a non-Hellenistic city. Um, you know, what, what's the, the cultural category they try to impose, I guess, uh, upon, you know, the, this kind of curious temple and city in their imagination? Well, that's a very interesting question, because on the one hand, the Romans knew the Jews quite well. There were plenty mm -hmm. of Jews in Rome. There were a lot of Jews in Alexandria, which were then being ruled by Rome as well. And they were pretty sniffy about the Jews, to be honest. They thought keeping Sabbath was a ludicrous idea. They mm -hmm. told stories about how Jews lost wars, something you should never do if you're a Roman, because they refused <laughs> to fight on the Sabbath. And they also thought Jews were being a bit evangelical. They were, mm -hmm. Judaism generally is not evangelical. They thought it's a bit surprising that lots of people want to be Jewish. They must be doing something. So there are all these sort of suspicions about the Jews in Roman culture to begin with. But on the other hand, when Romans get to Jerusalem, the city itself they know as the capital, they know the temple is a great building, so they treat it as such as a military uh, objective. But when they get into the, the Holy of Holies, they have a real confusion. Because, of course, R Rome is not only a deeply materialistic religious society, which every god has his temple, and there are hundreds of temples and hundreds of statues, and hundreds of gods. But one of the things the Romans regularly did when they took a new place was to pick up the gods and take them back to Rome. Mm -hmm. That's how you integrated foreign cultures into Rome. You carried off the gods. <laughs> if you get there and there's nothing there, what are you going to take? How are you going to show you've conquered these people? What's Rome going to think about this? So for Pompey, it was a huge failure of public relations, as well as a conceptual <laughs> error. And so mm -hmm. he had no way of really processing this information. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. And the uh, Jews, of course, loved this story, because oh, it yes. showed how they were, their religion was transcendent in the sense that they were mm -hmm. beyond and above in their non-materialistic religion. So that was very important. But it's not that there's no information from the Roman Empire. What we have to remember is that it's very carefully placed. So what we do have from that period is one of the longest accounts and deepest accounts of any ethnography, which is Josephus, mm -hmm. who not only writes the, the war against the Jews from his side, he was a commander in the war before he came over to the world, but he also writes on the antiquities of the Jews, in mm -hmm. which he retells the whole of the Torah, the whole of the Bible, uh, for a Roman audience in Greek, which is Greek is the language of Roman elite as well. So what we're getting is a sort of reverse ethnography. It's a very interesting moment mm. in which you've got someone who is, to Jewish eyes, a traitor. He's left his own side and gone over to Rome to, to live with the emperor in, in Rome. But he's trying to explain Judaism to the Romans in their own terms without losing this essence of Judaism. So mm. it's one of the most interesting ethnographies. We often get, scholars often get caught up with the question of you know, whose side was he on, what was he like, and we haven't had quite enough discussion of this extraordinary event of what's it like to try and explain your culture to another mm -hmm. culture, but in their terms, not in mm -hmm. your terms. <laughs> so we do actually have an absolutely fascinating set of texts from there. Unfortunately, neither the classicists nor the Jews really want to own Josephus. <laughs> because he goes right, right. right. <laughs> Yeah, he is an, an awkward figure, I suppose, you yes. know, from those perspectives, yeah. doesn't fit neatly in any yeah. category we've constructed. And I suppose I should say that, um, in contrast, you mentioned Tacitus as Germania, and mm -hmm. Germania, of course, is written by a Roman who goes and looks at Germany mm -hmm. and goes, wow, here is a people whose purity and antiquity gives us a moral lesson of what we've mm -hmm. lost in Rome. So it's a very particular ideological slant. It's not right. just, I've come across a foreign culture, I want to explain it. It's here, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a moral lesson by looking at the foreign culture. It's very different from Josephus, who's saying, I am that foreign culture, and you're going to mm -hmm. learn about it, but you're going to learn about a language you understand. Right, right. 
Yeah, it is. It's fascinatingly it's mediated in all sorts of ways. Yeah. And, and you wonder, you know, when Caligula tries to put a giant statue of himself, you know, in the temple, yeah, if he feels like that, that's, that's like, it's, he's giving it what he's been missing all along, you know, the, 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 finally a god for the temple that you can kind of hang on to. Yeah, absolutely. But you've got to remember that the Great Revolt starts, according to the Jews, because when Herod finished his temple, mm -hmm. the, the temple, um, they tried to put an eagle over the door. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And you know, the eagle is not a big statue of Caligula, but it is an image of Rome. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, we know that there are images in the temple, cherubim and others. Mm -hmm. That eagle was said to be the, you know, the straw that broke right, the, the camelback. The scarf, the yeah. Huh, yeah, it, it is fascinating. And I think about the temple itself is actually a, a good segue. You know, Herod's temple is, of course, this great grandiose structure. We still mm -hmm. have that wonderful retaining wall, of course, you know, the Western wall um, remaining yeah. from it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it follows, of course, you know, the the, 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 the scriptural uh, plans for the original temple. It, it, it reproduces those, but, you know, it's grander, taller, whatever else. Um, but despite this uh, scriptural exactitude, um, it uses techniques and uh, I think a grandiosity, a monumentality that seems very, at least to my eyes, very Roman, um, very like Herod's own projects at Caesarea, for example, um, or his, you know, his uh, hippodrome and theater in Jerusalem, wherever those actually were. Yeah. Um, and so to what extent, I guess, should we see the temple um, as a, a sort of a Roman building or rather, again, sort of like Jerusalem itself, um, a, a, a Jewish building that's been Romanized to some degree? Well, Herod is the central figure in the story, as you indicated, and he's a very interesting figure because how Jewish is he, how Roman mm -hmm. is he, is something that was being debated already in the period. Right. Um, and he's clearly put in place by the Romans. He rules as a Roman. He speaks to Romans in Rome. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't quite belong to the Jewish community as a man anyway. Mm -hmm. And what he does do is clearly... Hellenize, as I would say, <laughs> Jerusalem and, and the Caesarea, which he builds, named after mm -hmm. Caesar, after all. And he does so by introducing certain institutions that are associated in the Talmud and elsewhere with Roman authority. Mm -hmm. So you don't just introduce a hippodrome into a Jewish city. That's that's an imposition. You don't introduce mm -hmm. a bathhouse into a Jewish city. It's an imposition. And so he's doing these things, and he's building this huge temple. But to understand why that is so shocking, isn't a temple just beautiful? Isn't it nice to have mm -hmm. a good building? I mean, most banks in England are designed like Roman temples, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, because one of the most remarkable things about the Jewish temple to everybody in the ancient world was it was the only temple. Mm -hmm. That's to say, all other cults had temples all over the place. So, if you wanted to worship Zeus, you could go to Athens, you could go to Olympia, you could go to Corinth, there would be a temple of Zeus. You might have local cults which were were local, so it'd be Zeus in, but it was still mm -hmm. Zeus. You could see it all across the world. Religion was an international event. It was spread by traders. It was all over the place by ports. You know, you would go everywhere, and you could, wherever you went, you would see a similar sort of sacrificial ritual, a similar sort of game. But the Temple of Jerusalem was the only temple for Jews. They had to go on pilgrimage to the temple to commit a do, do a sacrifice, and there were certain festivals that had to be done in Jerusalem. So the Temple of Jerusalem has a completely different place in the imagination of Jews than any other temple does for the imagination of Romans and Greeks. And that's something mm -hmm. the Romans and Greeks couldn't get their heads around in some ways. Mm -hmm. so this was more than just a temple. This was the temple. You know, as mm -hmm. it's called in Hebrew, Amakom, it's the place. You know, there's, no other, there's no other equivalent. <clears throat> mm -hmm. and so by messing with it, by changing what it looked like, Herod was doing something really, really shocking. I mean, there was opposition to it at the time. The sacrifices had to stop for a period while it was being rebuilt. It changed into a huge, huge edifice that was terribly difficult to conquer for the Romans. It took days to, to you know, siege, and it's also a military center in that sense. And so what's going on there is a very frightening moment for Jewish culture, for the people in Jerusalem. I'm not sure they could really comprehend between, you know, caught between, on the one hand, the splendor and glory which made them proud. The temple was still the temple. But on the other hand, it had changed shape, sort of. It had changed feel. And it became something that was associated in their heads rather, rather worryingly with a ruler who was so associated with Rome. Mm -hmm. So it became a, a rather difficult moment. Now, that was assimilated quite quickly and became the center of the Jewish revolt. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, it's a, it's a very different sort of building from any other. 
Yes, again, it's basically you were saying about how central the temple is to mm-hmm. Jewish culture in a way that the Romans never could, you know, quite grasp. But just, you know, yeah. again, one more building. Yeah. And thinking to what degree this is an imposition on Herod's part, you know, there, there's those uh, houses they found by the, I think it's the, the wool mm-hmm. Museum of Archaeology, you know, the, the, kind of near the temple, that yeah. probably belonged to priests or people linked to the temple in some way that are Roman era dwellings, mm-hmm. which have, you know, the, the nikvas, the various the ritual yeah. implements of Judaism, but also these seemingly very Roman mosaics, you know, alongside them. Yeah. And so one wonders to what degree, um, you know, Herod's imposition, which is still an imposition, um, how shocking it was to this class of people, you know, how Romanized the Jewish elite is, you know, in the Second right. Temple period. Well, as far as we tell. there, mm-hmm. of course, this is a question replete with ideological significance, because there are plenty of people who would like to deny that there was this sort of contact. But the mm-hmm. archaeological evidence and the social evidence is absolutely clear. They were completely Hellenized. There's just mm-hmm. no doubt about that. Right. So if you go into, I mean, there are quite extraordinary buildings being discovered now, right up into the 5th century. Mm-hmm. And um, that, in some senses, the 5th century is the most interesting place to go because you find Jewish synagogues, which are then, as it were, becoming places of worship as well as places of meeting after mm-hmm. the destruction of the temple, which are completely full, not just of mosaics, but of mosaics with the zodiac and the mm-hmm. sun in the middle, Helios, you know, which is a Greek god. And now, of course, it's not being worshipped as a Greek god. It's part, we say, it's part of the imagery of the culture. But nonetheless, for a, a place, for a religion that specifies in Exodus 20 that you shall not make any graven image, to mm-hmm. fill your synagogue with images, even if you put Hebrew on to say this is a verse from the Bible and here's this picture of that, mm-hmm. you're still filling your synagogue with, with, with images. And um, they filled their houses too. And their houses had pictures of Dionysus, in them. I mean, the god of wine and theater, mm-hmm. because he was a big cultural figure for the, uh, for the Greeks and therefore picked up by the, by the Hellenized Jews. So there's no question whatsoever that in many ways, much the same way as a house in America, maybe a Jewish house but looks pretty well like a Christian house down the street. I'm afraid to say that Jewish houses look pretty much like Greek houses down mm-hmm. the street. Yeah, right. So in some ways, here it's not imposing at all, just sort of acknowledging um, a cultural reality. Yeah, that... the difference between your house and the temple. Of, of course, that's true. And, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. and, and, and the temple, yes. yes the temple. Right. So you can make yeah, it right. bus in different ways. But uh, right, right, yeah. it's an extremely interesting and complex question about mm-hmm. how people work with such Hellenization. And the rabbis themselves can barely deal with it. I mean, you get instructions in the Talmud saying you shouldn't uh, allow your daughters to learn Greek, and Greek learning is a very dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. At the same time, we know that Rabbi Gamaliel had hundreds of students who were learning Greek to communicate with the authorities, and there's mm-hmm. barely a page of Talmud without a Greek word on it. So, you know, again, you could have people the rabbis who are passionately opposed to the dominant Greek culture, trying to construct a world without Greek culture, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, they can't help but quote Greek culture. So even in your denial of Greekness, you are Greek. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Ineluctable. Um, So you mentioned how Jerusalem is always at once an imagined city, um, as well as a physical one of brick and mortar. And, you know, after the destruction of the temple, of course, the temple is transposed completely into that realm of memory. You know, it is now something that's remembered and, you know, uh, in various ways reimagined um, in the Talmud above all. And so I I suppose, I'm sure it's an enormous question, um, but uh, how do representations of the temple and of Jerusalem in the Talmud, you know, written centuries after the destruction. Um, how do these transform um, Jerusalem and the temple, which is already central, of course, to Jewish culture before this. But um, yeah, how is this, uh, I don't know, apotheosized in various ways yeah. by the memory of a destroyed building? Well, on the one hand, they discuss the building, discuss the memory and make it part of teaching. Mm-hmm. So when you go and study certain tractates of the Talmud, you're studying what happened in the temple. And that mm-hmm. becomes, as it were, a religious obligation to remember, to remember uh, mm-hmm. what went on. And that's extremely important. We even get passages where somebody says, I forgot what happened. Could you explain to me again what happened? It's mm-hmm. very, very interesting. To see. Right, right. But it also becomes, as you said, a building of the imagination and therefore gets picked up and worked in different ways by different sorts of cultural memory. And it opens the route to a different sense of what the temple could be. It becomes a different mm-hmm. sort of symbol. It becomes a different sort of potential. And perhaps the clearest way is looking at visual images of the temple as it goes on all the way through history. To make the point very briefly and 
with a certain rhetorical simplification, if you go to the Renaissance, the temple looks like a Renaissance palace. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's extremely long, it's massive, it couldn't possibly even fit in Jerusalem, let alone mm-hmm. in the Temple Mount. It's got you know, beautifully swagged windows and mm-hmm. uh, symmetrical. If you go to 19th century Britain, you'll find pictures of the temple that look like King's Cross Station. <laughs> because they're the built in the style of Victoria. <laughs> you know, right, right. They're based on the same work, the same reading, mm-hmm. but they come up with completely different images according to their own culture. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the most fascinating things to see that because it becomes a textual culture, when you read it and you imagine it, everyone imagines it according to the resources of their own culture. And mm-hmm. so it comes out differently from place to place. Hmm. Yeah, the temple has been liberated from reality, I suppose, to some degree at that point. And of course, it's risen into heaven. A, right, right, a, right. A temple in heaven. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Huh. Well, that's fascinating. And so, you know, and it was interesting to me also is that the Romans they have their own remembrance of the temple and of Jerusalem's capture, you know, on their coins, yeah. you know, the Judea Capta, mm-hmm. you know, Archer Titus, um, yeah. and even the, the tax, the, the, the Fiscus Judaicus imposed on the Jews and, absolutely. you know, a lasting humiliation, um, you know, for the temple... Mm-hmm. The yeah. temple's destruction. Well, one of the reasons for destroying the temple was because it was a very wealthy site, because every Jew mm-hmm. around the Mediterranean paid tax to the temple. It was the temple, so you pay tax to the temple. Mm-hmm. So the, the fiscal Judeans didn't actually make a big difference to their economic right. condition, but now it was being paid somewhere else. So it was going into Rome, mm-hmm. and that was, that was troublesome. So it was a form of economic humiliation, as you say. And um, the Arch of Titus has remained till today an image of you know, the destruction of, of Judea. It's worth remembering that it was one of the first really serious rebellions against the empire. The mm-hmm. empire was very successful because it didn't encourage rebellion. It wasn't an oppressive empire in the way that some modern empires are. It actually allowed the elite to stay in power uh, in those different places. They had to help with running the place. And, of course, they paid tax to Rome. And Rome certainly mm-hmm. used their abilities uh, to extract economically what they needed from every country they ruled. But actually, in the second and third century, if you were in the Roman Empire and you were a foreigner, you had a pretty good life if you were part of the elite. So there was no encouragement from the elite to rebel. But the Jews really went for it. And they went for it full on. And it was several years. And they did it twice. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, not, not just the 70, but later with, uh, in the 140s. And so <clears throat> what's interesting about that is that the Jews then became a different sort of figure of the imagination for the Romans. And they were somebody who they had to destroy. They had to put down mm-hmm. and, 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 and crush the kingdom of the Jews, which is what they did. Of course, there was huge death, huge slavery of the survivors. And no Jews were allowed back in Jerusalem for many years. So it was really trying to shut down the Jewish center in response mm-hmm. to the Jewish revolt. So it became a big figure for the Romans at that point mm-hmm. uh, in terms of imperial propaganda. Well, yes, you know, and thinking about, you know, that, that second revolt, you know, the, the Bar, Bar Kokhba War, um, and how, you know, the Rome, which is apparently uh, instigated both by Hadrian banning circumcision um, and by his determination to reconstruct Jerusalem as a thoroughly Roman city, you know, of Ali Capitolina. Yeah, Capitolina, yeah. Mm. Um, and one wonders to what extent this is an imp- almost an extension of the same impulse as Caligula's setting up this great garish, or why is it a great garish uh, yeah. icon of himself in the temple? Yeah. Um, trying to make Jerusalem fit into the Roman idea of what a city should be. Or like the Seleucids with the Greek idea. Right, right. The difference is that, I mean, you could put this as grandly as you want and say one of the ways in which the Jews have suffered over centuries is by not fitting in. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. can be a positive and a negative. And the two sides are completely linked. So from, mm-hmm. it's because the Jews first had the Bible that the Christians get so excited in some ways mm-hmm. about the Jews. You know, and so you know, it's not fitting in has been a constant attack, which is then instituted by the ghetto, which then says, mm-hmm. ask me about not fitting in, you're going to fit out, you're going to go to this place, right. we're going to lock you away, and we're going to make it visible that you don't fit in. Mm-hmm. So it, you're absolutely right. It's been a very long and very uh, difficult history, very bloody history, because... You know, the desire for cultural normality is something that certain rulers and certain people who can't imagine difference are always committed to enforcing on other people. Mm-hmm. And that hasn't disappeared. So it's pretty comprehensible to us, I think. Uh, yeah. I'm afraid to say. Uh, and, you know, um, so yes, I think the Jews commitment to their religion, their text, their way of doing things was very bizarre. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my 
dear friends Keith Hopkins used to say, it's very extraordinary that the two religions that have survived from the ancient world, of course, are Judaism uh, and Christianity. And the two things you can't do in the ancient world with any security is feed yourself and have enough children. So how did the two religions survive? The one that said don't have sex and the other one that says don't eat pork. <laughs> 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 it's an obvious source of protein. <laughs> right. so, like, this is a real yeah, paradox right. about survival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, despite <laughs> themselves, they yeah. powered through, yeah. Uh, so maybe cultural difference is also a survival, form of survival too. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and thinking about, so when the Romans did themselves embrace um, a form of Judaism, essentially, in, in Christianity, um, and Jerusalem becomes um, a grand Christian city um, under Constantine and his successors yeah. for several yeah. centuries, um, there's this very complex history to deal with, yeah. um, both the fact that the Romans themselves had destroyed the city twice, basically, yeah. um, and that um, there's this memory, both of the Old Testament, which is now being venerated by Christians, mm -hmm. um, and of this destruction, and of the Jews themselves still being in the area, you know, somewhat awkwardly from their perspective. Mm -hmm. So how, um, in, again, a big question, um, in early Christian Jerusalem, is all of this mediated um, in the built environment? Well, it's an extremely complicated story, but the first <laughs> yes. thing that happens is that the temple is left as a ruin. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting thought. You've got the major center of a city, and they leave it as a ruin. They do it, treat it as a rubbish dump. Mm -hmm. And so when the Muslims came and actually conquered Jerusalem, the first thing they made, they made the, 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 the Greek ruler, the priest of the, of the Christian church there, was to crawl up on his hands and knees and start moving the rubbish. They said, this is a holy site. Why have you left it full of rubbish? And so the way Jerusalem now looks, dominated as it is by the, by, by the, mm -hmm. the Golden Dome and by the, by the Al-Aqsa Mosque, is because the Muslims took this place and cleaned it <laughs> from, the, from, the, from the Christian <laughs> filth that was left there as a sign mm -hmm. of the destruction of the Jews. So supersessionism, as we call it, the, the mm -hmm. Christianity to, to, to surpass previous religions, was physically embodied in the city by leaving the Temple Mount, the biggest monument of the city, as a mm -hmm. rubbish dump. At the same time you build the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and you start to say, because Helena, the mother of Constantine, discovers the, the cross, the true cross, uh, uh, in Jerusalem, and then we, get, we start building programs of churches all around this centre. And so the Roman layout continues, the streets laid out in Roman way, as, as we'd expect. But we start to use architecture to enforce a religious uh, cityscape. Mm -hmm. And so uh, where there was once the one temple, and you know, that was what we had in Jerusalem, and the rest was that, we surround the one temple as a space of ruin with a whole series of grander and grander churches to mm -hmm. make the point of who's in charge now. And that's the way it was mediated. Um, and the Jews were prevented from coming back except for one day a year when they were allowed to come and wail at the Western Wall. And mm -hmm. that's why it's called the Wailing Wall. And that was a way of performing the lamentation, which was performing the destruction, which was performing the supersessionism mm -hmm. of Christians. So again, it was a staged religious show of humiliation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, the, the Julian, the last pagan emperor, that his first impulse um, on seeing Jerusalem <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is to rebuild the temple. Yeah. That's, you know, the way to show that you know, yeah. the Christians have not conquered this site. So, uh, it was very interesting that Julian, uh, it was with Julian that we end uh, the genuine political hope of rebuilding the temple. Until mm -hmm. Julian in the fourth century, there were Jews who thought it might happen. And uh, it takes a, a while even after Julian for that, that, that fact to sink in. But once mm -hmm. Julian is killed and we're told that lightning struck the people who were trying to build the new temple. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. a Christian miracle. So, you know, <clears throat> it was taken as a sign from heaven that this would never be done. And, of course, Christian authorities insisted that it would not be done. But until mm -hmm. that moment, there was still some political hope. And that's the point at which Judaism really makes a significant move towards rabbinical Judaism and study mm -hmm. instead of cult and... Uh, prayer instead of God. And um, uh, yeah, and uh, if Julian had lived longer, who knows what would have happened. Mm -hmm. He didn't. <laughs> right, yeah. So often yeah. he had these con contingency in history. That's right. Um, well, this is, you know, a fascinating topic, and I'm sure it's been, um, 
you wrote this recent book on what it means to be a Jewish classicist. Um, yeah. They're thinking about, you know, in, in personal tens, ter, personal lenses mm. on the, these issues. Mm. And so I, I suppose, you know, for you thinking about these topics, um, has this been uh, personally significant, personally rewarding? Usually so. It's uh, mm-hmm. a very strange thing that most people who come to classics to study classics, Greek antiquity, come to it from a culture, not all people, most people come, particularly in the West, they come from a culture that has long espoused the belief that Western culture has its roots in Greco-Roman culture. You will say democracy, theatre, medicine, music, mm-hmm. science, all of these are Greek words, they all have the Latin words, and they all have the tradition, and that's where we come from, and Greece and Rome are the centres, the origins of Western culture in that way. It's not true for Jews, of course. They have a long history of resisting Greco-Roman mm-hmm. culture. So for a Jew to go into classics is already making a bit of a statement about uh, an anti-cultural position or an anti-authoritarian position. <clears throat> but that's doubled by the fact that a lot of Greco-Roman writing from Christians is very anti-Jewish. I mean, mm-hmm. It's just historically the case. John Chrysostom writes you know, three or four sermons, a whole series of sermons against mm-hmm. the Jews. And um, what I found very strange uh, was that most modern Christians would say about John, well, when he says he's writing against the Jews, what is he really writing about is other Christians. And I think I believe that too, that he is writing about other Christians. Right? He's mm-hmm. writing about what you shouldn't do as a Christian. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. That's his audience. But for some reason, what gets forgotten in that is that he's still saying, we hate the Jews. <laughs> he's still saying the Jews are bad. And that had direct policy effect. That sort of discourse, Jews were kicked out of cities, Jews were killed, Jews, there were problems. And so I'm stuck with that double feeling of I shouldn't really be studying classics because that's not in my tradition, but I'm still a Western European, so I want to. And I'm going to then start reading texts in Greek and Latin that are telling me I'm a terrible person. And then I'm going to read scholarship saying, oh, but it doesn't mean you, so forget <laughs> about it. And so it's a very interesting moment. And um, it's a rather strange it's a rather strange cultural position. Let me put it like this. If you, this is what I discovered by asking the question, what is a Jewish classicist? That was a question I asked myself and I asked a lot of other people. It's interesting that there was only one Jewish classicist as a professor in America before 1937, 38. And he went very quickly into, into uh, administration, published a great deal oh, and right. in California, and was a California administration. After the Second World War, we suddenly start to get Jews coming to classics in America. So I was very interested by this sort of cultural move. How are we going to explain it? How are we going to talk about it? So I interviewed 30, 40 classicists to ask them about the question. If you want to know what is a Jewish classicist, ask a load of classicists. What do they think? Mm-hmm. And it was fascinating to me because if you asked a feminist who was a woman, do you choose the work you do as a classicist? because you're a woman and you're a feminist. I mean, almost all say, yeah, that what I work on, the way I work on it is because I'm a feminist. That's what I do. Feminism is part of my identity. Exactly. Is part of my identity. If you ask a Marxist, they'd certainly say, you know, what I work on and the way I work mm-hmm. on it is because I'm a Marxist. And today, if you ask a black scholar, a black classicist, is what you work on determined by your blackness? They'd say, yes, I'm a black classicist. Mm-hmm. So I went around and I asked a load of Jews, are you a Jewish classicist? And they kept saying these, well, I don't know, maybe he is, I'm not sure I am. They would tell you a joke, they'd tell you a story, <laughs> they'd pass the buck around the room, they'd say, he is, I am. And you suddenly realised it wasn't an identity politics that Jews wanted to play. Hmm. I think they'd had too much experience of the negativity of identity politics when you get classed and categorised by who you are, and often in a very negative way, that they weren't prepared to take that on board. And so I had this fascinating question that to ask what is a Jewish classicist turns out to be a quite a different question, at least gets different answers from are you a black classicist, are you a feminist classicist, are you a Marxist classicist, or whatever. And this day of identity politics, it seemed to me to be very interesting. Mm-hmm. That it was an identity that people were prepared to narrate, to talk about, discuss, but there were very few people who wanted mm-hmm. to say, yes, that's me, I want to claim that position. Right. And I found that a rather seductively attractive idea that you might be fully aware of your tradition, you might take part in it, but you also might see yourself slightly at an angle, you might ironize, you might feel a little bit alienated, you might, mm-hmm. you know, that to me is a little bit more like what was earlier years. So uh, that's what the book explores.
Well, it's fascinating. And one wonders how parallel that is to what happened in antiquity, you know, to be a Hellenistic Jew, you know, Absolutely. Jew of the diaspora or even, you know, a Jew in Jerusalem, yeah. one of these lovely houses that has both a mikvah and mosaics. Mm. Yeah. And you know, there's always this mediation going on. Sure. Um, sure. And I suppose so is Jerusalem itself, you know, existing simultaneously as this, mm. you know, provincial city in the, in the Greek, Greek Roman, Roman world and yeah. as the central city, you know, in the Jewish imagination. Yeah. And there's never one, never the other, but always uh, both yes. simultaneously to some degree. That's absolutely right. And I find that ability to have more than one hat a very yes. good sign of cultural maturity, not mm. cultural fissure. <laughs> I think there's a, one of the things that's worst about the modern world at the moment is the increasing demand to be one thing, mm. as if you're not multiple things all the time. That you have to be on this side, and there's no other side you could look at. Mm -hmm. You know that sort of polarized political debate, you're either with us or you're against us, you're this or you're that. I think actually mm -hmm. people have a lot more, uh, it's a lot more mature and a lot more interesting to think about our differences and our similarities as more of a matrix of possibilities mm -hmm. than it's just one defined position. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I, I, I certainly hope so. <laughs> um, well, anyway, um, Dr. Goldhill, thanks so much um, for this interview. This has been very interesting. Um, to anyone who wants to read more about this, um, Dr. Goldhill's book on Jerusalem, City of Longing, um, and his book on the Second Temple um, are both highly recommended. Um, you'll find them wherever books are sold, in addition to his other work. Um, and so, again, um, thanks so much, Dr. Goldhill, for coming on the program. Pleasure. It's been very, very interesting to talk to you. Nice to see you. Uh, well, likewise. And everyone, uh, thanks very much for listening.